click and clack. Good morning. Uh, yeah, it is a wonderful day out today. And uh, yesterday we had a wonderful time at the uh, Clama Marina, just enjoying the sun. And uh, overall, it's been a pretty wonderful week. Uh, we, we got to experience some automobile issues this week, which was always fun. Uh, we have a hybrid, which we may be regretting right now, but um, we had some issues with it and we had to wait around for a tow truck for about two hours and they finally showed up and it was stressful. But there's always, you know, something good can come out of everything bad. And as a result, we, uh, we went and had dinner at Killer Burger, which I highly recommend. It's a wonderful thing. But, um, you know, a lot of times when we go through these, these hard times, these trials, it's really hard to see that something good could, can come of it. Uh, I was just talking with Dan, and I think for us, one of the nice things that came of it was, you know, the car has an issue, and it's almost natural to want to blame your spouse or blame somebody or well, why didn't you do this or how come you didn't notice that and uh it's kind of nice when things like that happen and you don't find yourself blaming each other in fact it's more like i'm not blaming you please please don't blame me and we'll get through this just fine and that's exactly what happened and so e even through those stressful times you know it's kind of nice to appreciate and um, and just endure and then have a killer burger, right? So today we're, we have uh, three verses we were going to cover. Uh, in preparation for this, uh, I think this is way too long. So we're probably going to only cover about a third or two thirds of it, and then we'll continue it next week. But we're going to start off by reading uh, Psalms 139. And uh, the first 12 verses, and then we'll jump to the couple other verses. So if you want to follow along with me, uh, I believe this is the NIV version. And it says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know where I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, uh, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is light to you. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Let's open a prayer. Father God, amen. Search me. Know me. Help me. Guide me. Encourage me. Father God, as we... Uh, we study your word today. Our goal is to be closer to you, to be more united with you, to have our actions, our thoughts, our deeds reflect your love, your joy, your presence in this world. Father God, please help us apply this. We invite you into this, this service, into this message, into our hearts, and we just praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So for me, the main takeaway from this is God knows me 
better than I know myself. He knows all of me. Have you ever done something and wondered, why did I do that? What was I thinking? You know, sometimes you're startled or, you know, something happens and you just find yourself like, where did that come from? I have no idea. That is so not me. Or that is the old you that's still residually hanging on and clinging to you. Uh, I may surprise myself with some of my actions, but the scripture makes it clear that it's not a surprise to God because God knew my thoughts and all the things that led up to those actions before I even acted on them. He knows me so well that nothing is a surprise to him. Even if I'm startled, it's not a surprise. For me, one of the best examples of this is fear. You know, fear is one of those things that you don't expect it, you don't anticipate it, but it'll just start creeping in on you. And a lot of times that fear is uh, not knowing or having, you know, the future is unclear to you and you start playing mind games and future tripping and, oh, what if this and what if that? And and that fear just starts to take control of you and consume you. There are times when I fall into this trap, when I am fearful. And what the root cause of that is unknown. But God knows, because he knows me better than myself. I felt a wave of fear yesterday, and I shared it with my wife. Um, Every once in a while, I will, you know, start preparing for a message or going through the scripture. And I think to myself, who are you kidding? You're a pastor? What are you thinking? What do you have to share? You know, you, you have done bad stuff. And, uh, and that, that fear just starts creeping in on me. And, uh, and I have to resist the fear. And I think that the biggest issue I have when the fear creeps in is I start asking questions like, uh, what do I have to share? What can I present? What can I do? And that's the root cause of my fear is the I, I, I centeredness of it. And for me, the one thing that helps dispel that fear and helps give me clarity is it's not about me. If it were about me, yes. I would fail. And for me yesterday, the thing that really helped me was I started reflecting on my testimony. And, you know, I just reminded myself of how I got here. I reminded myself of that calling I clearly received, of that Holy Holy Spirit overwhelming experience that I went through. Um, that I heard the voice of God calling me to this ministry. The reality is I have lots of doubts about my abilities and why I'm here, but I don't doubt that God called me to be here. And God knows me better than I know myself. And when I start doubting myself it is when I need to trust that the one that knows me better than me knows that I'm supposed to be doing this. And it's just a matter of me just stopping and surrendering and accepting that, Lord, I'm trusting you to get me through this. Now, last week, Trina talked about hope. And, um, and I just wanted to share a, a definition of hope that resonates with me and I find very helpful. And it says, a biblical term referring to the expectation of the believer that God will fulfill promises made in the past. Biblical hope is more than a simple wish. It entails certainty based on God's demonstration of faithfulness to people in the history of salvation as recorded in the scripture and as experienced by the church. Hope is an expectation that God keeps his promises that he is a man of integrity and his word, and he will be there for us. And when I start having doubts like I had yesterday, I have to remind myself, 
this last year and a half that I've been here as a pastor, he's gotten me through every Sunday. He has helped prepare the messages for me to, to give. He's emboldened me to get here in front of people and share that scripture. He's been faithful. So for me to like out of the blue start doubting that yesterday was irrational. And so I just have to stop and remind myself of my own testimony and know that I can trust God's promises. And because of that, I have hope. And because of that hope, I can be here today. This is one of the reasons, you know, I sound like a broken record, but it's important for us to have our testimonies, to have them rehearsed, to have them, the scripture talks about being prepared to give your testimony. Yesterday, I gave my testimony to myself. And I was blessed because of it. And so we need to, we need to be prepared to give that testimony to others and to ourselves in times of despair or fear, you know, so that we can cling to the hope of the Lord. <clears throat> Even before I say something, especially something I'm going to regret, God knows my thoughts and he knows what leads up to what was spoken, right? And so in the criminal justice system, you need to be convicted of committing a crime, of doing an action, of, you know, accosting somebody or, you know, there has to be something that is done in order for you to be found guilty. But if God knows our thoughts before we actually do stuff, then perhaps just thinking about it is cause for repentance, even if there was no act. You know, Jesus talks about, oh, you, uh, you have bad thoughts towards that person, murderer. Oh, you're lusting after that person, adulterer. And so he's calling people out by just their thoughts. You know, so, you know, I'm suggesting that when those thoughts come, repent immediately. Repent immediately and turn away from those thoughts. Ask God for help with those thoughts. Uh, thoughts like anger that cannot be forgiven of somebody that, that has hurt you in the past. Repent of those thoughts so that you can, you know, with God's help, have them purged from your, you know, mental process, thereby allowing a greater uh, chasm or less likelihood of you ever actually performing or committing those things, right? You want to get those thoughts out before they, you know, snowball into actual actions. So repent, repent of the thoughts, because God's aware of them. That's right. And we need to make sure that they're dealt with uh, before they become greater. Um, so let's walk through some of these verses here because there's a couple of interesting verses that, you know, a lot of people, self-included, just kind of like might skim by like, yeah, I'm not sure what that means, and then just keep moving on. Um, verse 5 says, You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. It seems interesting to be hemmed in, you know. So if you look at the, the word, the definition of hem, in the Hebrew, uh, it says cramp, confine. Uh, in many applications, uh, literal and figurative, formative or hostile, adversary, assault, besiege, uh, beset, bind, uh, distress. Uh, I like the, the last one, put in a bag. So you're sealing something in, you're surrounding it, you're almost kind of squishing it. Uh, to, to be a fortress that's being besieged, you're surrounded. You have nowhere to go. There is no escape. It is there. Same with being put in a bag. I've never experienced that, but um, hopefully I never will. This imagery of being hemmed in is interesting. You are you know, it's, you, everything is around you. It's pressing in and squeezing you. I kind of visualize being, you know, in a submarine or, or deep below the surface. And just the deeper you go, the more the pressure gets and the, and the stronger that force is against you. 
Um, my nature, my natural way is to be hostile towards God, right? We've talked about that recently. Um, if, if I reject the word, if I reject his will, I am demonstrating a hostility to God. And so here we have this wonderful image of me and my fortress with pockets of hostility in me, resistance, but the grace of God is all around me and there's no escaping it and it's pressing in on me and I just need to yield and let it have the victory in my life. And so a lot of times, you know, I think, I think a lot of people out there have this image of God's up in heaven and God says, you have a choice. If you choose me, I will be with you. If you don't, you know, whatever. That's your deal. You have freedom of choice. But this scripture gives a, I think, cooler vision where God's just not sitting around waiting to see or if you're going to choose curtain number one or curtain number two. God is pressing in on us. He's there. He's surrounding us. His grace is abounding. And we feel that presence. Whether we respond to it, whether we, you know, have that prevenient grace that is all about us permeate our lives, yes, that's up to us. But he's not just sitting around waiting. He's at war with the decay that's still in our lives. And for me, that's kind of exciting. You know, he is aggressively pursuing me and you. And there's excitement in that. Uh, verse 6 goes on to say, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. We tend to use the word wonderful a lot. Um, and I thought it was great that when Glenda came up here, she said she had a wonderful time. And, you know, I kind of opened up with, you know, this was wonderful and that was wonderful. And I think these flowers are wonderful. Um, but let's look at the definition of what it means to be wonderful. And, and this is, you know, from the biblical word that's being used in here. Um, it says, wonderful, fantastic, beyond understanding, pertaining to that which is impossible to understand, with a focus on it as a marvelous positive mystery. In a word, incomprehensible. And we use the word wonderful. The flowers really are wonderful because when you think of all that goes into the creation of a flower, the bees, the pollination, the weather, the weather system, the seasons that, you know, flowers are a wonder. And, and we can study, you know, flowerology <laughs> uh, or, you know, nature or whatever. And, and we can get a glimpse of all that goes into it. But the reality is, there's so much more that we don't know. It's, flowers are wonderful. The weather is wonderful. You know, the sunny weather is wonderful, but rainy weather is wonderful too. Because even with all our understanding of, you know, weather uh, and meteorology, we can look at the reports and know that we really don't know what we're talking about because the accuracy is horrible. But that's, it's still a wonder. And we need to remember, you know, what it truly means to be wonderful. There's so much out there that we try to pretend to understand. And we only have really, we're scratching the surface of the truth of it. And I look forward to the day when I can cast off this shell and, you know, and be in the presence of God and start to really understand all of the wonders that surround us that frankly we take for granted we've become complacent about you know and there's so much wonder out there and uh yeah anyway so the, the psalmist is just calling out that you know your wonder is beyond my comprehension and i think that's a healthy attitude for us to have verse 7 goes on to say uh where can i go from your spirit where can I flee from your presence? 
If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, which would be the, the rising sun, which would be the east. If I settle on the far side of the sea, which would be the west. Um, wherever I go, the Lord is there. Verse uh, 11 says, uh, If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not, is not dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. Now, when I read these verses, I think of a Michael W. Smith song, and I was, I got to get a copy of it for us to sing in worship. Um, and it's, Even the darkness is light to you. Love that song. When I read this, you know, and there's nowhere to go, you know, it's hard to wrap your head around even the darkness is light to you, right? It's kind of hard for us in our reality. But then I think, you know what? I'm thinking of things through my understanding of reality. And we just talked about how there's wonders going on beyond my grasp. For us, light and darkness are physical. They're, they're things of this realm. But in the spiritual realm, I doubt those things matter. So what darkness can hide to me, the spirit sees right through. And so even if I try to suppress something and lock it down deep inside me and pretend it never happened, the spirit sees through all of that. And there are so many of us that have hurts and traumas and things that we've endured in life that we just try to bury deep down, you know, and suppress. And the Holy Spirit sees it. God the Father sees these things and sees how they, they even if we ignore them and pretend they're not there, how they can eat us out from inside. You know, it's, it's, it's a tumor that we need to deal with. Um, the deepest sarcots, the secrets that we have are plain and visible to God. And I kind of wonder how if the day ever comes when those things we've been running away from all of our lives, when we finally say, today is the day I'm going to deal with this. I'm finally going to bring it to the surface. I wonder if, you know, the Father says, I've been patiently waiting for you. I've been waiting for this day for you to finally deal with this. Now I can help you. Now we can start the healing journey together because it's always been there and it's been plainly seen. But God is a gentleman and he's not gonna force treatment on you. You have to first acknowledge that you need a physician and then he can come in and help you. Verse 23 and 24 say, Search me, God. You know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. God knows all of our offenses, even the ones we're not aware of. You know, And so it's wise for us to prayerfully seek those offensive offenses, to, to lay our heart open and say, Lord, please show me, you know, the things I've suppressed that I need to deal with. Show with me the, the thoughts I've had that may not have actually materialized into actions, but that I need to be aware of and I need to deal with, and I need to make sure that don't actually become actions. Uh, we need to be open and receptive, acknowledging the, the, the truth um, and inviting that healing. And that healing requires repentance. It requires that we deal with things uh, as they come. And so here's the part where I get to the one-third in, and I say to myself, if I keep going, this will be an hour plus long, and that is not okay. Um, and so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wrap it up right here, and then we'll pick up next week. But I I just want to share this one thing when when we talk about how God knows us better than He knows ourselves, 
when he knows our, our darkest, you know, deepest thoughts and fears. For some people, that's incredibly comforting. And for other people, it's terrifying. <laughs> And, uh, and I want to, I want to allow myself to surrender enough that I am not terrified of anything, that I just bear my soul to my God and to my wife and have no secrets, no barriers, and that I can deal with these things. Because when fear comes up, not only did I deal with it by releasing it to God and saying, I trust you, but I shared it with somebody that I trusted. Um, she is my safe person, just like uh, Glenda was the safe person for her family member. And it's important to have a safe person to be able to open up with. And so as you're dealing with stuff, you're verbalizing it and you're making sure that it is in the light. You know, and so I am grateful for you. Thank you for being my safe person. And uh, praise be to God that I fear nothing, you know, not even death. I'm not afraid of death. I'm looking forward to answers and wonders and stuff. I'm not trying to hasten a day, you know. I try to ride my motorcycle responsibly most of the time. But, but I'm still looking forward to those things, you know, all the wonders that are out there. And, uh, and we're going to be there sometime, experiencing and learning and knowing. And it's pretty exciting. So I'm just grateful for you. And uh, let's, let's close in prayer. And we will pick it up next week. Father God, we just praise you. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are our hope. Thank you that we, tr we can trust you, that you will keep your word. Thank you that I have a history of experience of you keeping your word, of you being here by my side, holding me up, supporting me, encouraging me, emboldening me. Lord, thank you that I have that testimony that I can share with myself and with others. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your calling. Lord, I just pray that you would make clear to all of us what we are called to do, what our individual missions are, what we are commissioned, each and every one of us to do. And then I ask that you would uh, encourage us to share that with each other so that we can, as a community, as a family, uh, prepare each other to fulfill that calling that you would be glorified. And we just praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.